Welcome to EF Academy. What an incredible turnout we have tonight. Whether you traveled from across the city or just down the street, thank you for taking time out of your busy week for this special event that we have tonight. This is our inaugural year here in Pasadena, and we are thrilled to welcome you to our beautiful new campus. EF Academy was first established in Oxford, England. We are part of EF Education First, which is the world's largest private international education organization. EF was founded in 1965 by an entrepreneur named Bertel Holt. Bertel is dyslexic, and as a young Swedish teen, he didn't do well in traditional school. However, his entire outlook and trajectory changed when he learned to speak fluent English while working in England. He realized that immersive experiential learning was extremely powerful and he could help students like him learn in non-traditional ways. 58 years later, EF has created transformational experiences for tens of millions of students worldwide through language learning, educational tours, cultural exchange, and traditional academic degree programs. Over the years, EF learned so much about how different types of students learn that we used that expertise to create a new type of high school. Between our campuses in Oxford, New York, and now Pasadena, we have empowered thousands of high school students to become confident, resilient, and responsible global citizens. We focus on competency-based learning, which uses a holistic educational approach to ensure that every student discovers their true potential while prioritizing their well-being. This is my personal passion and my commitment to each of our families. We will always prioritize and continue to learn more ourselves about how we can help students graduate with the skills they personally need to achieve both success and happiness throughout their lives. And this is why we are here tonight. As parents, educators, and teens, I see you students, thank you for being here. I know that understanding mental health and well-being and figuring out how we can navigate these tricky teenage years is so very critical. Which is why we are absolutely thrilled to introduce a new speaker series about helping students become successful and happy. And there is no one better to kick off this series than Yale professor, psychologist, and happiness expert, Dr. Lori Santos. Dr. Santos is an expert on human cognition, its origins, and the evolutionary biases that influence our all too imperfect life choices. Her course at Yale University, Psychology and the Good Life, teaches students what the science of psychology says about how to make wiser choices and live a life that's happier and more fulfilling. This class is so great that it is Yale's most popular course in over 300 years, and it has been adapted into a free Coursera program that has been taken by over 3.3 million people to date. And it's now also on YouTube. Lately, you can hear Dr. Santos directly on her podcast, The Happiness Lab, which launched in 2019 and has over 35 million downloads. From our perspective, there is no one better to teach us about the science of well-being for teens. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lori Santos. Thank you all so much. It's fantastic to be out here in Southern California, although it feels a lot more like my home back on the East Coast weather-wise, but we'll take it, we'll take it. Um, first, just by show of hands, how many students am I talking to tonight? Students out there, awesome. How many uh, parents, educators, non-students? Awesome, so about half and half. Um, so this is great because what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna give a quick precis of my class, uh, the science of well-being for teens, to try to teach you kind of strategies that you can use to feel better. And these are gonna be really important strategies for those of you out here who are teenagers yourself. But they're also gonna be really important strategies for parents to start thinking about what are ways that we can support 
the kids in our lives so that they can feel a little bit happier, so they can succeed, but also be mentally healthy as well. And so I'm gonna do that by kind of giving you a quick version of the class, but first I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got interested in the science of well-being in the first place. And so as mentioned, I am a faculty member at this lovely school at Yale University. I've been teaching there for almost two decades now. But in more recent times, I took on a new role on campus where I became a head of college, which means I live on campus with students. And I thought college life was gonna be like what it was like back in the 90s when I went to college, but it wasn't like that. I was actually seeing the college student mental health crisis up close and personal, where so many students in my community were reporting feeling depressed, anxious, just overwhelmed all the time. And I worried that this might be something particular to Yale, maybe this is a sort of Ivy League thing, but that got me digging into kind of the real statistics nationally on college student mental health. And the numbers are pretty bad. This is the kind of thing we're hearing in the news and so on, but I think it's worth starting with what our college students are facing nationally when it comes to their mental health. And you'll notice this was back in 2019, so these are even pre-COVID numbers. But right now, nationally, more than 40% of college students report being too depressed to function most days. Um, another over 50% say that they feel hopeless most of the time. An equal number of students are experiencing overwhelming anxiety. Over two-thirds say it's hard to do anything because they experience anxiety all the time. We're also seeing about two-thirds of students saying that they report feeling very lonely. These are students who live on a college campus with other folks, but two-thirds of them say I spend most of my time feeling very lonely. And many students are overwhelmed all the time. 87% of them say, I just feel constantly overwhelmed by all the academic stress, all the stuff I need to do. And this manifests, as you might expect, in some even yuckier mental health statistics, like the fact that more than one in 10 college students has seriously considered suicide in the last year. Um, and these are numbers that we're seeing are even worse in younger populations. The CDC just put out a report showing that these, are, these numbers are pretty similar on things like suicidality and teenage teenagers generally, but especially teenage girls. And so this is awful, like this is a real crisis, and this is what I was seeing on the ground in my community. I thought, I need to do something about it. My students aren't learning in the way that I'm expecting them to if we're not solving this crisis. And because I'm a nerdy psychologist, I said, ah, I will just develop a new class. I'll kind of figure out what does is, what is the science say about the kinds of things we can do to be healthier, particularly for teenagers and college students. I'll kind of slap it all together. I'll, I'll christen it something fun so it pops out of the course catalog. I called it Psychology and the Good Life. So it was like, oh, the good life, this would be cool. But it really was just a whole, everything that we know that the science says that you can do individually to promote your happiness. That's not to say there are not big structural changes that we need to do to promote happiness. We need to do that too. But this was a psychology class about individual things you could do to feel better. But it was a new class on campus. I figured a few students would take it. You, can, you heard the epilogue of the story, but you can imagine my surprise when I walked into a classroom that looked like this. This is what it looks like when a quarter of the entire Yale student body is taking your class. Um, <laughs> Like, a little bit of a logistics nightmare, but, but, but it was cool, right? It showed me that young people are voting with their feet. They don't like this culture of feeling stressed out and anxious all the time, and they really wanted evidence-based strategies that they could use to feel better. They didn't want platitudes. They wanted to say, what does the science say I can really do to feel better? And so that was the story of the class, but if you were paying really close attention to that kind of syllabus, you might have noticed that this all started back in 2018, when I think it was really prescient to be thinking about mental health in college students, right? You know, fast forward to 2023, and I think the mental health for all of us these days feels really like a dumpster fire, to be totally <laughs> frank, right? For a million reasons, right? COVID-19, we're in three, you know, year three of this terrible pandemic that we didn't wish for, right? Climate change, the economy, political polarization, anti-black violence, like everything you look at is just crummy right now. And that uncertainty and anxiety is taking a huge hit on all of our mental health, but especially the mental health of our young people. And so that raises the question of like, okay, given all this stuff that's gotten worse since I first started teaching this class, how can we focus on feeling happier in 2023? In particular, what can teens do to focus on their mental health in the midst of all the academic pressures and social pressures and stresses they face? That's what we're going to go through today, but I have the challenging task of switching my entire class down into 40 minutes. And so we have to kind of prioritize. So we're going to go through a little listicle version. I'm gonna give you the top seven insights that science gives us, the things we should be prioritizing if we really wanna focus on our mental health. Starting with top insight number one, which is that if we really want to focus on our own mental health, we need to get a little bit other-oriented. You know, you might hear a lot about this idea of self-care or treat yourself, you know, pay attention to yourself, self, self, self. 
But if you really look at the science, that's not what the science shows. The science shows that happiness seems to come from being a little bit more other-oriented. First, other-oriented, just in that you want to be around real people in real life more often. Every available study of happy people shows that happy people are more social. They spend more physical time around other people, and they prioritize in real lifetime with their friends and family members and the people they care about. Right? This is a big thing we see in a difference, a generational difference in teenagers today, which is that teenagers are just not, literally not spending a lot of time around other people, especially around their friends. But we can hack that, right? This is a choice we can prioritize and make differently. So that's kind of other-oriented part one, is we gotta be around other people. But there's also evidence that we gotta get rid of this idea of treating yourself, that happiness is all about me, me, me. The evidence suggests if you look at happy people, happy people are more socially good. They're doing good things for other people. They're out there trying to help the people in their neighborhood, the people in their community, and people around the world. They're constantly doing things for others. Now you might say, that's great for those happy people. They're, you know, they're happy, they wanna do nice stuff for other people. I'm feeling miserable, I don't wanna do nice stuff for others, right? And this is where we need a kind of scientific experiment. We can force people to do nice stuff for others and see what happens. And this is is just what many, many different studies have done. This is some work by Elizabeth Dunn and her colleagues. She does a study where she walks up to people on the street and says, hey, do you want to be in a study? People say yes, and she just hands them some money. It's a fun study to be in because you just get some money. But the key is that Liz is going to tell you how to spend it. She says, by the end of the day, you need to either spend this money on someone else, do something nice for someone else, or by the end of the day, you need to do something to treat yourself. And then I'm going to call you later, and you're going to self-report your happiness. What does she find? She finds that at the end of the day, and even at the end of the week, people who just spend that same amount of money on someone else were happier than people who spent it on themselves. Again, this is not what we predict, but this is what the data show. And I think this is something that we kind of have to build in, right? We think that social connection is just around, about being around other people, that that's gonna improve our self-care. But I think we need to kind of get a little bit more other-oriented and start paying attention more to the other people in our lives and the priorities that they might care about. What can you do to get out of your own headspace and do something nice for someone else, whether it's text a friend or just check in? And I think we need to pay attention to the opportunity costs of those moments of in real life social connection. You know, how many of our family dinners or dinners in the dining hall with students look like this, where you're on your phone and not really paying attention, right? You're kind of getting the, maybe the sort of neutral suite of social connection online because you're reading through some feed, but you're missing out on social connection in real life. Um, can you actually kind of put your technology away to really connect with people in real life? Or if you're using your technology, make sure you're using it to connect, if not in person, in real time. So you're actually, there's evidence that talking in real time can give you as much social benefit as kind of just you know, talking in real life. But it has to be not just like flicking through a feed or texting someone, it has to be in real time. So the desktop insight number one, we have to prioritize being other oriented, being around other people and focused on other people more. And we have to make sure, pay attention to the opportunity costs that are dragging us away from that. Top insight number one. Now we get to top insight number two, which is also kind of hard in the modern day, which is that if we want to be happier, we need to make time for gratitude, a little bit of a mindset shift, right? This is the kind of thing that sounds like grandmotherly advice, you know, be grateful, but it's common wisdom, but it is not common practice. These days, if you look at our discourse, we are not kind of expressing gratitude everywhere. We're kind of expressing a lot of complaints. We talk about hassles. And to my teens in the room, I, I talk about about meme culture. Teens will know what I mean by memes. If you're making little memes, often you're making memes not about the wholesome things in life and all the things you're grateful for. You're making memes about the things you're making fun of because you're complaining about them and you're mad about them, right? Which feels fun, but the evidence suggests that it's actually psychologically not as good for us. We do that as an opportunity cost of focusing on the things we're grateful for. And this is another spot where the science has kind of forced people to engage in gratitude and have seen really great effects, right? So the simple act of writing down three to five things you're grateful for at night, researchers like Sonia Lubomirsky and her colleagues have found that this can significantly improve your well-being in as little as two weeks. 
right? Just two weeks of scribbling down a few things that you're grateful for every night, now your well-being is significantly boosted. But it's not just that your well-being is significantly boosted. You're actually better at other kinds of tasks that you care about. You're more successful at other stuff you want to achieve. For example, there's evidence that it's much easier to self-regulate, to eat healthier, to save more for retirement, to study when you really want to go do something else. You can power through things that are a little bit tougher because you're grateful, because you kind of feel like, I got that good stuff in the bank, so I can sort of make a little sacrifice right now. So things like saving, things like studying, these things matter a lot. But gratitude is even more powerful when we express it to other people, when we kind of combine it with the tip that you just heard. Because oftentimes, if you're grateful for things, you might scribble it down in some sort of gratitude journal, but often you want to express gratitude to other people. The things that we're grateful for tend to be others and what they do for us, but we tend not to express it. But then we're missing out on a big impact on our happiness because when we express gratitude to other people, we have to make a social connection, we're kind of doing something nice in that social connection, and we're kind of experiencing this mindset shift where we feel thankful. And the evidence suggests that this can be a bigger boost and a more longer lasting boost to our well-being than we expect. And because you're all nerds like me, I'm gonna show you the data on this. This is a study by Marty Seligman and his colleagues. He gives his college students that he tests the following prompt where he has, I want you to do a gratitude visit to someone. In the next week, I want you to write a letter of gratitude to someone who's helped you or been especially kind to you, but you never had a chance to properly thank that person. And then I want you to deliver the letter to that person, you know, in person, or maybe over Zoom or something, and read it to them. When I first presented this to my college students at Yale, students in class screamed out, awkward, which is like, or emo was another thing I heard, which is like, you know, it's college students speak for like, this is going to feel a little weird, right? That's what we all predict. But what happens when people do this is different. It's not nearly as awkward as we expect, and it has lots of positive benefits that we don't expect. And that's the graph I'm going to show you now. I'm going to plot uh, people's self-reported happiness. These are on these standardized scales. The white bars will be when people do this gratitude visit, and the black bars will be when you have people engage in a control condition. So you write down some happy memories. So you might get a boost in happiness, but not so much. And so here's what you find. Before the test, no difference between these two groups of subjects. After the test, you get a small but significant bump up in happiness. And this is always what we're talking about, by the way, is small but significant bumps. That's what you see here. But the cool thing about Seligman's study is he followed his subjects out for months after doing this gratitude visit. And what he finds is that that bump in happiness, small but significant, lasts. It lasts for anywhere between one to three months. Imagine you can do some sort of intervention that will bump up your happiness straight through the beginning of the summer. Like students who I think are in the middle of like AP exam, some of you, you just do this intervention, it's just gonna give you that small but significant bump that's gonna last, you know, till the summer begins, right? When we say that, that sounds incredible, like that seems like a shocking level of an effect, but that's the power of gratitude. We need to be making time for it. We don't realize the power that that subtle mindset shift can have. So that was top insight number two. Now we jump to top insight number three, which are things that we can do to promote our happiness in our physical bodies that have a big effect on our mental health. And this is that if we really want to be happier, we need to prioritize healthy habits. What do I mean by healthy habits? I mean the stuff we know is good for our physical health, but we forget can be really essential for our mental health. Um, like the simple act of exercising. There's evidence that a half hour of cardio every day can be as effective at reducing symptoms of depression as taking the leading anti-depression medication. Meta-analyses have shown this. Similar effects for anxiety. We forget that our bodies are like connected you know, to our brains and that affecting our body can help. And again, this doesn't have to be running a marathon. This is just getting out and moving your body a little bit more. It can be really, really powerful. But an even more powerful hack to your physical body that I think matters even more for teens is this. I have to explain to my Yale students what this is. This is the act of sleep. It seems so foreign to you, right? Um, it seems foreign because my Yale students come into class and they're often doing this because these days many college students are reporting getting on average around three hours of sleep a night. And you're gonna see why that's bad here. Um, because the study by Dinguez and colleagues looked at this. This is another spot where I'm going to nerd out and show you the data because I think it's so powerful. Um, but they did the study where they test subjects' mood across different levels of sleep. So subjects start the study and they get 7.4 hours of sleep, basically seven to eight hours, which is what we're supposed to be getting a night. More if you are under 18, you should be getting more like eight or nine on average. But this is what these adult subjects got in this study. 
Then these researchers deprive subjects of sleep. They get only five hours a night. And this is where my college students start laughing because they're like, that's a good night. That's pretty good, right? You have to get special like human subjects approval to run this study, but this is what we find. So a week you have deprived sleep, and then you go back to normal levels of sleep. And what I'm going to show you is um, what's called a profile of mood score. It's just a mood score that clinical researchers use. Higher numbers is, is good mood. And as you get to the bottom of the scale, you have mood levels that look like you have clinical depression. And this is what you see after a single week of a lack of sleep. Basically, your emotion levels tank. Like you look like you should be on one of those antidepressant medications simply because you're not sleeping. The good news is that as sleep goes back up, those mood levels go back up too. But this is the problem of not getting a lot of sleep. And that means that we need to, again, be thinking about the things that are kind of have this opportunity cost of messing up our sleep. You know, how many of us get exposed to the little blue light at the middle of the night, right? Because our phones are near us. You're just going to watch a couple TikTok videos to relax, but then it's two hours later and you're still staring at this blue light. And you've seen a bunch of anxiety provoking information and your brain is all wired up and now you can't fall asleep. And the students are nodding, but a lot of the adults are nodding too, because this is not just a problem for students. This is a problem for parents too. And so I think one quick hack we can do is to not be around these devices that are such a huge opportunity cost for our sleep when we're going to sleep. And so parents, if you want the perfect happiness-inducing birthday or college graduation gift or whatever, high school graduation gift, I recommend this, <laughs> the alarm clock that won't wake you up and give you the blue light at night. But seriously, what can we do to move our phones away during these hours that we preciously need to sleep? And so that's insight number three. Bodies matter, and hacking our bodies can have huge effects on our mental health, both in terms of moving our bodies, eating healthy, but also and especially sleep. I actually think we can solve most of the college student mental health crisis and teen mental health crisis if we could just get them to sleep. So parents and educators, help me out with this. But this is top insight number three. Now we get to top insight number four, which is moving a little bit past the physical body and sort of thinking about how our mindsets work. And so top insight number four is that if you really want to be happier, you need to find ways to be present so you're noticing the good stuff in life. You know, this idea of mindfulness and being present is something we hear about a lot lately, but again, just like it's kind of common wisdom, it is not common practice. Common practice looks different than mindfulness. It looks like this, where you're constantly thinking about a million other things and whatever you're doing right now, right? You're thinking about that exam that you're about to take in two weeks' time, right, rather than just being here and being present, whether you're eating or talking with a friend and so on, our minds are everywhere else. Um, researchers estimate that we spend about 50 percent of our time, just under 50 percent of our time, mind wandering and not paying attention. And that evidence is problematic, not just because we're missing our lives, which is sort of bad. It's like bad to just not be paying attention to your life. But it's also bad for our happiness because no matter what you're mind wandering to, research suggests that you, if you self-report how you're feeling at that moment of mind wandering, you're feeling worse. Even if you're thinking about an upcoming vacation you have or what you're going to do when all the AP exams are over or whatever, you're actually less happy than if you're just focused on whatever the task at hand is, even if the task at hand is kind of crummy. And so we need ways to kind of fight this mind wandering to pay attention a little bit more. And the evidence gives us two strategies we can use. One is a practice that we can turn on at any moment, and it's just the simple act of savoring, right? If you're eating something delicious or something nice is happening, what does that feel like? What does it taste like? How would I describe this to somebody? What are the colors? How can I engage my senses? Just turn on presence. It's available to us at any moment. But there's another practice we can engage in that sort of builds up our mindfulness muscles over time, which makes it easier to stop that mind wandering. And this is the practice of meditation. Um, there's been a lot of scientific work on meditation in terms of improving concentration and so on. Basically, my take on the way meditation does this is that if you've ever meditated, you know that the practice is, I'm going to think about my breath, or I'm going to think about my, a mantra, I'm going to think about something, but inevitably, if you've done it, your mind goes away, and you notice, and you're like, and you kind of yank your mind back on task. That sort of yank is like doing a bicep curl for your mind. Like, that's the work. And so if you've ever meditated and like, oh, I'm really bad at it because my mind always wanders, I have to yank my mind back on task, that's the work. Like, that's what you're supposed to be doing. That's like doing a rep for your mindfulness. But the evidence suggests that those reps pay off. In fact, over time, individuals who meditate more often report being more able to focus on tasks, but also less likely to mind wander when it matters. Not when you're meditating, but when you're having a conversation with your kid or when you need to be studying and you need to focus, right? 
Meditation actually allows you to be more present later on when it matters. And so that's top insight number four. We need to find ways to get back to the present moment so we can like notice all the good stuff and be present for our lives. But top insight number four comes with a corollary too, which is that the science suggests we don't just need to be in the present moment when it feels awesome and it's like ice cream and unicorns and rainbows. The evidence suggests that we'd also be happier if we focused on being present when the present moment felt crappy. And I'm not sure about any of your present moments lately, but at least some of them, you know, in the last three years of the midst of these crises that we've been facing have felt pretty crappy. You know, students on campus, like this is the end of the semester. This is when tests are coming up and stuff. You can feel depressed, sad, anxious, a little bit overwhelmed, angry that the end of your year is kind of filled with all the stuff that you need to deal with. And all those emotions are normative. They are normal reactions to the fluctuations of life and the research suggests that you wanna be there with them. Even though they feel bad, it turns out the research suggests that they are good. It's kind of like if you put your hand on a hot stove, you'll yank it, it will feel terrible, but you'll yank it away. You'll engage in a behavior that allows you to do something better. So your hand, your skin is not burning and your flesh isn't all messed up and stuff. Negative emotions work exactly the same way. They are signals that there's something that we need to pay attention to. But often, we don't pay attention to them because we're spending a lot of our time pretending that they're not there. And especially students at a place like EF Academy, you all are amazing students, you wanna have a like, stiff upper lip. You wanna pretend that everything's fine. You wanna push through and just like pretend everything's okay. Negative emotion, nope, not me, I'm just gonna be fine. But the evidence suggests that that strategy just doesn't work, A, and B, has lots of negative consequences, um, often for the stuff that you really wanna be doing when you're pushing these emotions away. And so one study by the Stanford neuroscientist James Gross and his colleagues tested this directly. They brought in uh, subjects to the lab, college students, and said, uh, had these college students watch really sad videos. So whatever you do, make sure that the experimenter doesn't know you're feeling sad. Try to suppress those emotions as much as possible. Um, what happens? Well, first, subjects do worse on a memory test. They do worse on a decision-making test. They're basically messing up their academic performance by trying to suppress these emotions. We think we're doing it well, but it takes a lot of work to hold that kind of emotional beach ball under the water, as it were, and that has an effect on our cognitive performance. But it also has an effect on our bodies. You can even, in this short laboratory task, see evidence of cardiac stress that these subjects are under. So you're actually putting your bodies under stress um, to the point that almost like you had a terrible stress test just because you're suppressing your emotions. So it doesn't work. It raises this interesting question of like, okay, we shouldn't suppress these emotions. We should kind of listen to them. But how do we do that? How do we listen to these emotions and get through it? And one of my favorite practices for kind of tackling this is a particular meditation practice that's been popularized by the meditation teacher Tara Brock. And it's a meditation practice that goes by the acronym of RAIN, which stands for Recognize, Allow, Investigate, and Nurture. So let's say you're experiencing a negative emotion. You, if you're an adult in the room, you get an email from a colleague that makes you kind of sad. If you're anyone in the room, you look at the news and it's something that makes you feel a little overwhelmed. If you're a student, you get some weird, you know, kind of reply on Snapchat, somebody blows you off, or you're like looking at your test, you're feeling overwhelmed, right? Negative emotion is there and you say, aha, that Yale lady said I could use rain. And you just commit to taking five minutes to just doing this practice. And you've already achieved step number one, which is the R, recognize what is happening but you get a little bit deeper. You just, you don't say, I'm just experiencing a negative emotion. You say, okay, what negative emotion is it? Is it overwhelmed with a side of sadness? You know, maybe it's feeling frustrated with a little bit of loneliness, right? Like really sit there and try to use your words like almost like a thesaurus, like your SAT word student to figure out what emotion exactly am I dealing with? What percentages, right? You're kind of paying attention. And then once you figure out what that is, you switch to the next step, which is the A, allow. You say, you know what? You know, 75 5% overwhelm with a 25% side of sadness. I'm just gonna let you be there in my body just as you are. And I'm gonna pay attention to you. I'm not gonna run away. I'm just gonna non-judgmentally allow this emotion to be there. But you give yourself something to do while you're allowing that emotion to be there. And that's the next step that I investigate. With some interesting care, no judgment, what does this feel like in your body? Maybe your brow is furrowing. Maybe you want to run away from it and you have an urge to like watch a TikTok video or pick up your phone or like for parents, take a drink. Like it doesn't, don't act on those. Just like, huh, this is when this comes up, this is when I don't want to sit with this emotion, this is what's happening. And the key of this investigate step is that research suggests that emotions are kind of like a wave. When you pay attention, they will go up and they'll feel more intense. 
but you're not going to be in that state forever. It's going to kind of go down and go away. But you're kind of giving your brain something to do so you can ride the wave, as researchers often call it. But then you don't end there because negative emotions are a pain. They're not really fun to deal with. And so you end with the last step, which is end, to nurture. Um, what can you do to take care of yourself? Maybe you need to call a friend. Maybe you need to call your parents, students out there. Like, what can you do to take something off your plate, right? Um, research suggests that practices like RAIN are really powerful for folks who have to deal with a lot of negative emotion, not just students who are facing AP exams, but palliative care workers who are dealing with people dying all the time, or first responders and so on. These practices can reduce negative emotions and can also reduce burnout too. And so that's top insight number five. We need to make sure we're in the present moment and staying there and paying attention, not just when everything is rosy, but even when the world is feeling pretty crappy. And the act of noticing these negative emotions that are normative, that are there to teach you something and nurturing yourself afterwards is a powerful way to learn from them and to get through them as needed. So that's top insight number five. We're on the kind of not so good negative emotion stuff, so we're gonna switch gears. And that's to top insight number six, which is that if we want to be happier, we need to make sure we're prioritizing some kind of true fun each and every day. One of the tragedies of modern life is that we're so busy all the time and we're so overwhelmed all the time that when we do get free time, we often don't do stuff that's really fun with that free time. We're often feeling so kind of tired that like the easiest thing to do is like sit there and just watch some TV, which might feel relaxing, but it probably doesn't feel like fun, like it's energizing you and so on. Or even worse, maybe when we're feeling a little overwhelmed, instead of like sitting down and watching TV, we go on and we sort of scroll through a feed. Maybe get like a little NutraSweet hit of social connection, but it's not really nutritious in the way we expect, right? This is often the way we spend a lot of leisure time, and this is the way that our young people are spending more of their leisure time than they ever had in generations before. And that means you're not getting a kind of real rest that you need. Real rest that you need comes from this sense of fun. Um, what is fun? Well, there's been a lot of interesting recent work on fun. My favorite of this comes uh, from this woman, Catherine Price, who's a journalist who's written this book on the power of fun. But she says we need to start thinking of fun as having three particular parts. It's not just something that's relaxing. She says that true fun involves probably a little stuff that you've heard about before, it involves connection. If you think back to a time when you were having so much fun, like the last time you had so much fun, it probably involves somebody else or a dog, or like, like some sort of real connection, right? So social connection, tick, right? We just heard about this. True fun also involves something that you just, just heard about, which is presence. When we're really having fun, time is flying by. We're feeling like we're in flow, right? We're not like thinking about checking our phone because we like just don't even think about it. It's just speeding by, right? So presence, which you just heard about. But true fun involves something we haven't talked about yet, which is playfulness, something else I think this generation uh, needs a little bit more of, which is just that you're doing something, not like play, like little kids play, like pretend play, but something for which it's internally rewarding. You're not trying to put it on your resume. You're not doing it for your LinkedIn. There's nothing external about it. It's just fun. You're just doing it because it's enjoyable. And the sad thing is when we look at those three definitions, young people often report like, I don't actually get that much fun. Like, I'm busy with my academics. I have extracurriculars, which maybe I enjoy, but sometimes there's pressure there too. And when I have time off, I just plop down and look at a screen, right? I just don't have time to do anything fun. And so there's this interesting question of like, okay, how do we find more fun? Um, and Catherine Price in her book gives us one strategy we can use to do that, which sounds not fun, but bear with me, it's gonna be fun. Um, she says we need to do a, an audit, a fun audit, as she calls it, right? But it's not regular audit, it's different. All the parents are like, <gasps> no, no, it's a fun audit. What does she mean by a fun audit? Well, to know how to get more fun, you have to figure out the kinds of things that you find fun, right? What are the things that give you a sense of connection and flow and playfulness? And she suggests doing a quick journaling practice where you just list three times in your life where you felt like you were having so much fun. Right? And no judgment, it can be from a couple years ago, especially older folks in the room, it might not have been recent, right? But what are those three times that you felt so fun? Imagine them now and watch just even how it feels in your body when you're like, oh man, that time was so fun, right? But then you do some investigating, you say, mm-hmm, 
okay, who was with me? Was I with other people? Who are the people I find fun? What was I doing? Where was I? Maybe you have more fun in nature. Or maybe you have more fun in like, I don't know, basketball courts like this or whatever. Like, where were you? Like, what was happening? And Catherine argues that you should be doing this to identify what she calls your fun factors. Maybe whenever there's fun, you know, dancing music playing, you have fun. Or maybe whenever you're out in nature, maybe when you're with a pet or an animal, like you're having fun. Whatever those are, like, pay attention to those. Those are the ingredients that you want to place in to your fun. And then the key is to add more moments like that. So that when you get some free time, rather than just plopping down and going to screen, you have a quick go-to of how you can add these things in. And the research suggests that when we engage in fun, we are not just happier, but we are actually more productive. What is a quick way to make college students and high school students a little bit more productive? Give them more time to be playful and have fun. Um, you find that people do better on memory tests when they're doing it, right? Because you're ready to be present and pay attention because you actually had a nutritious break from the studying. But the problem is I feel like this generation lacks these nutritious breaks because we keep our kids busier than ever. Um, many kids don't even know what it's like to have fun because they're constantly kind of scheduled like this. And that schedule doesn't include Include, do a thing that allows you to get connected, playful flow. You know, like those are just things that we're having them do to tick off their resumes. So finding these moments to figure out what, what really feels fun, because again, I think for a lot of young people, they don't know, they haven't explored that as much as maybe folks in earlier generations. But then actually clearing this calendar so you could get that fun in can be really, really powerful. So that's top insight number six. We gotta find time for true fun each and every day. Even if it feels frivolous, it is not frivolous because it's important for your happiness and it is important not just for your happiness but also for your productivity. So you're actually working better the more fun that you get in over time. So that's top insight number six. Now we're gonna jump to the final insight, top insight number seven. And I think it is the hardest one, which is why we save it for last, both for the teens in the room, but also definitely for our parents. Because if we want to be happier, the research shows that we need to find ways to become wealthy, but not wealthy in terms of money. We need to become wealthy in terms of time. This is sometimes when I present this lecture on Yale's campus to students who are sleeping, and I talk about money, it doesn't matter for having to like, oh yeah, I gotta get wealthy, what? What are you talking about? Wealthy in terms of time. What we're talking about is what researchers refer to as time affluence. This is a subjective sense that you feel wealthy in time. If someone says, hey, do you want to get together? You're like, whenever. My week's totally open and we can meet all the time. Um, it's the opposite of what many of us experience, which is time famine, where we're literally starving for time. And the evidence suggests that time famine works a lot like hunger famine. It actually has an impact on our immune system. It actually has an impact on our bodies when we just feel like we're triaging everything because we kind of can't, just don't have time to do anything. And as you might expect, if it's having a hit on our bodies, it also has a huge negative impact on our well-being. For adults, if you self-report being time famished a lot of the time, that's as big a decrement in your well-being as if you self-report being unemployed. You know, adults, if you suddenly lost your job today, that would probably be a big impact on your well-being. That same impact is happening if you just report being really busy all the time. But the problem is that we are really busy all the time. And it's not just the adults in the room that are feeling that. Um, students, how many of you, show of hands, feel like you have cal GCALs and calendars that look a little bit like this these days? Sheepish hands going up all over the place, right? Um, this isn't good, right? This isn't good for your mental health, but it's also not good for your productivity because what happens when you're in kind of triage mode is you're just getting stuff off the plate. You're not enjoying it anymore. You're not performing at the level you are. You're like missing out on your high school life. Or whether it's for, you're busy because of extracurriculars or academic work, even social stuff, the busier you are, the more negative impact this is having. I actually think the second thing we should do to reduce, you know, like first is get students get more sleep, but the second is to give them more time affluence. And so the question is, how do we do this? And I think step number one is that you just have to prioritize it. I think we've come up with a mistaken notion that for teens, a like super packed, overwhelming calendar with like academic stuff and all these extracurriculars and things is the path forward, right? It's the path to success. But I think we've messed that up. Even college admissions are having this an interesting article, I think it was in the New York Times about like, you know, how many extracurriculars do you really need? And most admissions officers are saying, honestly, like, 
one that you feel dedicated to, right? We're adding our plate of a million of these different things and it's not having the impact that we really think. But I think there are other ways we can hack our time affluence, not necessarily by giving ourselves more objective time, but by finding ways to give ourselves a little bit more subjective time. Interestingly, this time affluence isn't the sense of, of the objective amount of free time you have, it's the sense that you have free time. And that means you can hack the sense of your free time without actually hacking your objective amount of free time, um, which is kind of cool because it's hard to open up objective time. Um, so how do we do this? So parents, one way that you can do this is that you can spend your money to get back free time. Um, parents in the room, I imagine some of you have like bought takeout or done, you know, like gone out to a restaurant or something. You don't often think of that as a time savings, but the evidence suggests it really is. You know, if you go out and buy, you know, I don't know, pad thai takeout or something, that's noodles you didn't have to boil, I didn't have to look up the recipe online, I didn't have to clean up. Like if you put a time stamp on that, you might have saved like an hour and a half, two hours. What did you do with that free time? How did you use it well? Right? Evidence suggests that people who spend money to get back time um, wind up being happier. And the teen version of this is that the same thing seems to be true about sometimes sacrificing perfect, 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 perfect academics for having a little bit more free time. Like going to bed a little bit early when you haven't studied perfectly 110%, but you know, you studied 95% and that's fine, and then you get more sleep. Or you study 95% and you actually use that time to do something nurturing, like making an in real life social connection, right? Trading off money for time, for adults who are spending money on these things, or trading off kind of grades, academic success, which is kind of the time is money for students to get back more time, the evidence suggests is really, really powerful. So think about those trade-offs. But a different kind of powerful way to get back more time is to make good use of the free time we do have. Um, and this is the power of what researchers call time confetti. So time confetti are like the little pieces of time that we have, you know, five minutes when class ends early or 10 minutes when your toddler falls asleep, like we you know like your meeting ends or something like you get these little pieces of time that you didn't expect but when we get those, we don't use them well. Often, sometimes they make us a little anxious because we're not used to having free time. So we pick up a phone and we like look at something stupid on our phone. But like those little pieces of time add up. It turns out we actually have more free time than we did 20 years ago. Not a COVID thing, but over time, we've been getting more time. Over generations, we've been getting more time. But these days, it's broken up in stupid ways, especially for our teens. It's five minutes here, 10 minutes there. It's all this time confetti. What can you do to make good use of that? Like just really kind of pool it together so it actually is a lot of time. And researchers like Ashley Willens at Harvard Business School recommended making what she calls a time confetti wish list. So just like in a notes app on your phone. When you get that five minutes, what do you do? And it's not work things, for, it's not like academic things. It's text a friend to set up a time to talk or do a quick five minute meditation. You know, maybe if it's like seven minutes, you could do like New York Times seven minute workout or something like, like any of the things I just mentioned that improve your well being. And then you're kind of building on your time affluence because you're sort of pulling it together. It's not something they're just kind of wasting in the ether. You're really putting the time you do have to good work. And so that's top insight number seven. Ultimately, if we really want to be happier, we need to give ourselves more time. And again, students, you're going to say, but if I have more free time, it means I'm doing you know, less AP classes and less stuff and less, less, less. And to that, I say, yes, that's the point. Like you will perform better at doing those things. You will be happier. And you'll probably ultimately be more successful down the line. And so you just did the whole class. Congratulations. It's very short, very short version. Lots of others there to say. First Yale class, good job. Um, but if your interest was piqued and you want to learn more, um, I'll remind you, as we said at the beginning, that we've put the entire teen version of the class online on Coursera.org. Um, it's also on YouTube if you don't want to sign up and you want tiny clips. But really think about taking this, students who are there. Like you can kind of binge it like a Netflix series. I kept hearing when I met with students earlier about Modern Family and binging Modern Family, maybe just binge this instead and get some little tips that you might hear about. Um, but parents and family members out there, like binge it with your kids. Just I, I once heard this Yale lady talk. And this might be fun to watch it all together and just watch it and see what conversation comes up. I've heard so many emails from family members that say, her parents who say, you know, we watched your class and I didn't realize I was doing X, Y, and Z. 
and that it was making it worse, and now I've stopped doing that. So little insights that can come up like that. Um, but if you're looking at this saying, I'm time famished, I do not have time for a Yale class, neither does my kid, thank you very much. Um, I'll also point out, as mentioned, I also have a podcast, quick little 20 minute intervals while you're stuck in Southern California commuting time that you can use to hear these strategies and go for them. But ultimate point is that I hope I've convinced you that your happiness is important. And that even in the midst of tough times, there are strategies we can use to feel better. And teens out there, I hope I've convinced you that even though things might feel stressful, and even though you just saw those negative statistics, it doesn't need to be that way. There are individual weak steps we can take in addition to structural changes that we can make to try to fix this, to try to feel better. I hope I've given you some of those steps, uh, and I'm gonna express my gratitude to EF Academy for bringing me out, and I look forward to engaging with your questions. Thank you so much. Can we just get one more oh. round of applause for Dr. <laughs> Santos? Thank you. Thank you so much Thanks, for being Sonia. with our students today and here with our community tonight. I mean, I found that mesmerizing. Oh, thank you. I'm thank so you. grateful <laughs> that I got to hear that. And we did um, solicit some questions mm -hmm. from our community members, and we have a little time for some Q&A, so I'm going to ask Dr. Santos a couple questions. So our first one is, you know, students are often sent messages that narrow their definition of success to things like admission to selective colleges or high standardized test scores, uh, priorities that are often at odds with their wellness or mm -hmm. even their sense of self. How can adults in their lives better support teams in reframing success to center well-being? Yeah, I think parents obviously have good intentions with trying to you know, pay attention to sort of academic success and all these kind of narrower definitions. But I think this is a spot where our minds really lie to us and where the science is really helpful. We assume that happiness comes from like these successful things in life. You know, my kid gets into a good college, they make a lot of money, they will be happy, right? But there's lots of evidence for the opposite causal arrow. It's shocking, but this is just what the science shows, that if you are happier, if you experience higher positive mood, those things that you think are gonna get you the happiness and success will come more easily. How do we know this? Well, there's lots of studies that look at what are the ways that you get a higher salary? What are the ways that you get a job that you really love in life that you kind of you know, think of as prestigious? And we think it's all these academic skills and like the stuff you put on your LinkedIn but there's lots of evidence that it actually is your happiness. Um, one study by very famous UVA happiness professor, Ed Diener, uh, looked at students' cheerfulness at age 18. So you just standardize scores of how cheerful you, how much positive mood do you have, and use that to predict not just job obtainment at college graduation, but job obtainment at age 27 and at age 37. Those of you who are almost 18, imagine if I was predicting what kind of job you'd have and what salary you'd have in your 30s. And what Diener finds is that those students who self-report higher levels of positive mood, higher levels of cheerfulness at age 18, have a job, they have a job that they like, their boss says they're doing well at the job, so they're higher performance metrics, and they are uh, making more money. And so I think we get in our head of like, six, you know, I will you know, die with all these AP classes and like that will be the way that you get this stuff that we think matters for success later but we might be doing that at an opportunity cost of the things that really matter for success, which is like how, just like how much of a positive mood do you experience? Like just the social connections that you've developed, the soft skills, like these are the things that ultimately matter that we're not kind of teaching our teens in our life to put their emphasis on. And so my students, when they hear that, it's like, wait, I'm supposed to be prioritizing my cheerfulness now? I'm doing exactly the opposite. Like, I'm like taking on all this stuff that's like at opportunity cost, like which, which matters more? And I think you know, the research is starting to show that what matters more is the other. So I think knowing those factoids as parents, I think can give you a little bit of permission, honestly, to back off, right? To really ask like, am I kind of experiencing, is it, are the academics about learning and this stuff? Or is it about kind of pushing for this narrow, definition of success that might be hindering, ultimately, my student's definition of my, my kids' definition, like what's gonna actually be successful in my kids in the future. And so recognizing that we have the causal arrow wrong is sometimes really powerful. Um, I think it matters, the success does matter in life, right? But I think these, we sometimes get what's gonna get us there a little bit wrong. 
Thank you so much. That's a, a really brilliant reframing, a, a shift in causality. Yeah. I love that. Another question that came through is, how should parents balance the need for teens to be connected to their friends and community, sometimes on social media, while also encouraging them to maintain their self-esteem and well-being? Yeah, I think, you know, on social media is sort of a tool, right, that we can use in lots of positive ways and sometimes lots of negative ways, right? And so I think encouraging the use of that tool most productively is sort of the best way to do it, right? Um, and so what does that mean, right? Um, I think I hear from a lot of parents who are just really nervous about social media, especially with younger kids, parents of kids who are like a little younger, maybe in middle school, like should we have social media, should they be on phones and things like that. Um, and the, the answer that I often give parents is that um, you know, this is something that parents have to navigate in lots of different domains. Part of this is helping to regulate parents' anxiety about, like, what should I do? Of like, how should I, you know, pr present this? Um, and I like to use this analogy with nutrition, right? Like, most parents out there, you're probably not, like, nutrition science experts, but you feed your kids in, like, some reasonable way. Like, you want, like, some of the good stuff. You know, maybe sometimes it's, like, the not-so-nutritious stuff, but you want to balance that out. You probably have some rules about control over that in your house, but, you know, they're going to go off to school school or go off to friends' houses and they're going to try other things. And like, I think that's a good analogy for how you should think of social media, right? Like, what you want to do is to give kids their own control over what they're doing, but do it in a way where you're thinking about sort of what's a little bit more nutritious. And you might not be like social media scientists and like know about like mental health and what happens with social media, but you probably have some good ideas of what are the parts that are more nutritious and what are the parts that are not so nutritious. Like, um, you know, watching a bunch of TikTok videos on suicidality, probably not so nutritious for their mental health, right? But, you know, having time where they're actually on like, you know, like on Snapchat with a really good friend or with a friend group, that's probably a little bit better. But you still want that to not be, you know, you don't want to eat like 100 salads at night, so maybe you want to cut that down to like, you know, just an hour or two a day, right? And so I think this is an analogy I often like to give parents to remind parents, like, you actually have good instincts about what's nutritious for this stuff. If you frame it in terms of that kind of give and take, it can kind of give you some hints about how to deal with it. Um, for the students who might be asking the same question, right, like I want to stay connected on social media, uh, but sometimes I feel gross afterwards, especially like when I'm watching the like, you know, millions of TikTok videos and so on. Um, one of the strategies I like to use, again, comes from that journalist, Catherine Price, who also has a great book uh, called How to Break Up with Your Phone, where she argues we don't have to break up with our phones per se, but we need to take our phones to like couples counseling so that we can d develop a better relationship. And she has this acronym that my students find really helpful that she calls WWW, which stands for what for, why now, and what else. And so she argues whenever you pick up your phone, not just for social media, but for anything, you should ask yourself those three questions. If you go on her website, you can get like, like a little phone, like, you know, like, like elastic thingy that has WWW to remind you, and you can get one for free. But these are questions, what for? What was I on for? Was I doing something? Like, was I finding some piece of information? Was I specifically connecting with a friend? Like, what was it for? Or was there not really a purpose there? Um, why now? Which is sort of paying attention. This is kind of like this mindfulness for your emotions. What was the trigger? Maybe you were feeling bored or anxious. You know, maybe you were like, you know, sitting in the dining hall and you didn't want to like talk to anybody because you were feeling a little socially anxious, right? Like, what's the trigger, right? But most important is the last question, which is what else? Which is what's the opportunity cost? Like, what, what else could you be doing other than scrolling on social media? Maybe that's sleeping. Maybe that's talking to the people, your, you know, your roommate who's sitting there in real life. Maybe that's calling your parents on the phone, right? Like, like what else? Or maybe it's just being present in beautiful Southern California where you see the flowers on this lovely new campus, right? What are you missing by not being on your phone? And I like this strategy for teens because it gives you kind of a little bit of control to start noticing, like, oh, I go on whenever I'm feeling like mildly anxious. Is that the best way to regulate my emotions? Or I'm really missing out on like fun conversations with my roommate that I'm gonna miss, you know, when I take off over the summer. Like, what is that? What does that feel like? So it's a good strategy for sort of noticing. So I think the advice is find nutritious ways to engage socially on social media um, and to be mindful about what parts are nutritious and what's not. And then to kind of finally to go back to just what we talked about in the talk, that in real time, ideally in real life, but at least in real time, social connection is best. 
And parents, anything you can do to open up time and space for your kids to do that is great. I think if you tell them, you know, you studied enough this week, why don't we like have time to have some of your friends over or something like that, giving them permission to open up time for their own social connection can be quite powerful. Thank you. I'm gonna close with one last yeah. question, if that's okay. That's great, yeah. I mean, I think you've given so many self-monitoring tactics for teens to think about and, and for adults to consume for themselves as well. But for the adults in the room, the educators, the parents, the people at EF Academy who do both, as in yeah. Loco Parentis, what are the ways that adults can help intervene in stressful times to really be there to support and nourish wellness for students? Yeah, I think this gets to a strategy we talk a lot about in the online class, but didn't kind of have time to get into too much here, which is um, a way of sort of promoting healthier self-talk. I think when our teens are really stressed, they're incredibly self-critical in their heads, right? You know, if you could hear the nasty things they're saying about themselves, um, the stresses that they're putting on themselves, that's like you would just be so saddened and shocked. And I think the first strategy is not, don't contribute to that, even unnecessarily. Just simple like, oh, how's the studying going can make them feel like it's not, they're not studying enough and just simple things like that. But I think another strategy you can do is to try to kind of embody self-compassion in how you talk about them. Wonderful book by the psychologist Kristen Neff on this um, called Self-Compassion, where she kind of goes through the steps to kind of engage more self-compassionately. And they involve things like mindfulness, like calling it what it's like, it sounds like things are really stressful right now. This sounds like you're feeling really overwhelmed, right? Like help your teens recognize those emotions, especially if they're negative. Um, the second is uh, what she calls common humanity, which is like, that's normal. Like, it's really normal to feel stressed. It's really normal to feel overwhelmed. If they mess up, you know, it's really normal to like screw up, right? Like it's really normal to get bad grades. Like embody that in normativity, which it is, right? They're not robots, they're teenagers who are trying to go through things. Um, and then finally, self-kindness is the third part of self-compassion, which is like, what can you do to take care of yourself to nurture things? What can you do as a parent to take something off their plate? Give them permission to, take, to pick their own thing to take off their plate. These kinds of strategies are really powerful. We talk about them a lot in the class, but I think that mental shift um, to try to engage a little bit more self-compassion can be really powerful. And I think parents and educators can embody that in how you talk to teens. You can also embody it in how you talk to yourself because they're picking up some of these self-talk strategies from the way they hear us talk about ourselves. And so engaging in your own self-compassion, kind of putting your own oxygen mask on first can be really helpful as well. Dr. Santos, thank you. Thank you again thank you so, so much. So much. Thank you so much.